Welcome to Elmira Baptist Church Sunday School. Uh, I have not taught since May 9th. We had a special speaker, then we had the people from Fairhaven Baptist uh, College, and uh, what a joy that was to hear them. And we've been talking about Christian character, and we are talking, we had an introductory lesson uh, this is the second lesson. The first lesson was an introduction to Christian character, and this is going to be on patience. Now, when I saw that this was on patience, I had a little bit of um, hesitancy because sometimes when that happens, uh, the Lord teaches you patience as, a, as help in preparing your lesson. And that was in abundance this week. So hopefully you had a great week too. Uh, we are going to be, you should have a handout, Christian Character, and it, should, it was dated May 30th. Uh, welcome to everyone here. Grab a handout if you're listening, I hope, from, on uh, the internet via streaming. I'm hoping that you got yours via the newsletter attachment. Uh, the first page is a review of some of the things we talked about about three weeks ago, and also then page two and three is new on patience. Let's ask the Lord's help. We have a lot of material. I'm going to move right along. Let's pray and ask the Lord to give us uh, understanding and help in looking at his word with a fresh perspective. Father, I thank you for the privilege of sharing your word and this study about Christian character I pray that you would build patience in us, Father, as we certainly the recent pandemic crisis has truly given us an opportunity to build patience. I pray, Father, that we would reflect Christ-like character in all that we do and all that we say, and that you would help us to reflect the, we would be imitators of Christ and we would reflect his image in our dealings with each other and in situations. Bless our time together. Bless each one that is uh, here this morning for Sunday school, each one that is watching the live streaming or actually the recorded streaming. And uh, we just pray your assistance in helping us to understand your word and your Holy Spirit's illumination. In Jesus' name, amen. So last uh, time, I'm going to say it wasn't last week, and I may slip and say that, but last time we talked about uh, Christian character and introduced that subject and I introduced the term character amnesia that came from an Our Daily Bread that I found uh, in actually in 2011 it was from September 12, 2011 and C.H. Casper reads it seems that young people in China are beginning to forget how to write characters that comprise the beautiful calligraphy of their traditional language. Some are calling the phenomenon character amnesia. Heavy usage of computers and smartphones often means in China that writing has ne been neglected and some can no longer remember the characters that they learned in childhood. I think there's like 2,000 characters in, or more. One young man said, people don't write anything by hand anymore except their name and address. Also, some people appear to have character amnesia of a different sort when faced with a dilemma that they, they actually, when they're faced with that dilemma, seem to forget the right thing to do and instead choose the easy way out. God called Job a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, Job 1.8. Uh, Job 1, God allowed Satan to take everything Job had, his children, his wealth, and his health. But despite his heart-wrenching circumstances, Job refused to curse God. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrongdoing. Verse 23 of chapter 1. Satan had challenged God's assertion of blameless Job's blameless character, but he was proven wrong. Character amnesia? No, character is who we are. It's not something we forget. Those who have a loss of character make a choice. And Ritter wrote this verse. It isn't the tranquil and placid seas 
that bring out the sailor's skill. It's the wind and the waves that pound a ship and toss it about at will. When we get into adversity, that's what brings out our character. Now, we gave the definition last week of those biblical attributes on page one, right on your handout right after Christian character. Those biblical attributes, qualities or virtues reflecting Christ's likeness bestowed by the Holy Spirit and cultivated by the Christian in the process of growth and maturity for the glory of God, not man's glory, but God's glory. Now, I'm the kind of guy that likes to connect the dots. I, 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 when I started this study a lot of years ago, I began to think, well, how does character affect conduct? What's the connection? How does it work? So I kind of created this little uh, note that um, in saying that really helps see how these are connected. One, Christian character creates our perspective, our views. And if you want to write this down after that line, it's how we see. It's how we see things. And our perspective and our views shape, number two there, our attitudes and thoughts. And that's how we think. And then our attitudes and thoughts affect our decisions. This is how and what we do. And that results in our actions and conduct. That's how we act and what we do. So in bold, I have right below that, our Christian character, that is who we are in Christ, is directly connected to our conduct. I've heard people say, you want to, you want to know someone's theology? Look at how they act. Because we typically act and our conduct is in harmony with what we actually really believe, not, we, not what we say we believe. But our Christian character is directly connected to our conduct. Our Christian character creates our conduct. It affects and shapes and creates our conduct. For alliteration, I may see. Christian character creates our conduct. Now, I gave the illustration last uh, uh, lesson, in May 9th, about uh, that I found in LinkedIn written by Martin Carter. He said in 1979, an Air New Zealand Flight 901 crashed, crashed into a mountain, Erebus, E-R-E-B-U-S, in Antarctica, killing all 279 people on board. When they studied the cause of this, they found that they started from New Zealand with a two degree error in course. And that was the root cause of that um, error in their, of that crash, the error in their flight plan and their flight path. So they weren't headed in the right direction. You say, but it's only two degrees, that's a small error. Well, over the length of the flight, they wound up 28 miles to the east of where the pilots thought they were. And that's where a mountain was and they weren't high enough they thought they were somewhere else and they had clearance and they hit the mountain and killed everyone. He goes on to say, and this is, this is an article that was written to help people in uh, career, uh, career search, but he says the best pilots, and I would add the best Christians, are those who have the humility and wisdom to admit as good as they might be, they aren't perfect and need to constantly check and recheck that they're still on track, and so should we. The Holy Spirit uses our character, and he works directly with us to help us do that. Are we on God's course? Now, what we're actually doing is measuring ourselves by Christ and his character. Are we doing what God wants us to do? Now, looking at the two paragraphs right below the quote, um, and I want to say, my character will directly affect my direction, my decisions, and what I do, my conduct. Remember that. Those Christ-like attributes and qualities, our Christian character, are learned from God's Word, and they're, they are bestowed and used by the Holy Spirit to help us in guiding our lives, how we pilot and navigate our lives. 
The Holy Spirit guides us often by applying God's word in specific situations, using Christ-like character and principles to lead and pilot us both through smooth waters and also hazardous waters, those difficult situations in life. And each action or movement of the ship's wheel, or if you're in an airplane like I used to be, or the yoke that looks like a half a steering wheel, each movement leads us further on our journey and path and course. Are we on course? Are we on God's course? Are we on our course? If, we're on, if we are on our own course, guided by the flesh, we're off course and headed for danger. Are we cultivating Christ-like character in the power of the Holy Spirit to lead so that he can lead and direct us on God's chosen course? following his will? Are we sailing needlessly into harm's way or just sailing helplessly, aimlessly in circles, ignoring his course, his direction, and his will for us? Now, I went to survival training in the Air Force, and one of the things they taught us, they put us out for when you crash. The whole thing was what happens when you crash and how do you survive in a desolate wilderness. And they taught us and they showed us we had no compass, couldn't look at the stars, cloudy night, and you take off and you, the human tendency is to wander in circles and not go straight to where you're headed because you have no direction and character provides that direction. Um, I gave the illustration of uh, the Bismarck that um, got loose in the North Atlantic and many things happened and they were on the search for where the Bismarck, they, they, they had a confrontation with it. The Bismarck sank the biggest, most famous battleship, HMS Hood, and it devastated the British. And they were afraid it was going to sink all the shipping that was a lifeline between England and the United States and Russia and the United States. So they sent every ship after the Bismarck, sink the Bismarck. And they had a major confrontation. They found them. Their aircraft carrier only had biplanes that had two wing, looked like World War I aircraft with a, with a torpedo underneath. And the Bismarck shot most of those down, but one small insignificant biplane shot a torpedo and hit the steering gear. And the people on the Bismarck actually laughed in derision and mocking of that, of that uh, fruitless effort. But what they didn't realize is that was their Achilles heel. That steering gear at the rudder was jammed in a turn. So the Bismarck did nothing but circle round and round and round. And it was sunk by the British ships. They could sit back at their leisure and just shell the Bismarck and it sunk. Now, that's how we are if we're not following through the power of the Holy Spirit, Christian character. And we are to be followers, a second bullet uh, down there towards the bottom of the page, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 and 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Paul tells us, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And wherefore I beseech you be followers of me, now, that word followers is the word uh, that means, uh, it's memetes, M-I-M-E-T-E-S. It's, it, it's, I've spelled it out for you in your handout. It's, it's the word that we get mimi, mimeo, uh, memo from and mimeograph and uh, mimic means to imitate. We're to be imitators of Christ. We are, develop, we are to develop Christ-like character as imitators of Christ. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, he's urging them to be imitators just as a child imitates his father. And we are to be imitators of the Christ, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we imitators of Christ? Or are we imitators of the world, the flesh, and the devil? And don't underestimate the power and influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is extremely subtle. You need to, as we learn, check your course. Are you on course? Are you, are you imitating Christ? Are you imitating someone else? Uh, one of these other things. Uh, 
And I think of um, in the Cold War, Russia used to, close to their borders, take uh, false navigational aids for the aircraft uh, and they would try to lead the American and other um, allies' aircraft off course by putting false information into the navigational aid that would send a false signal. And they wanted to lead them astray. And that's what the world of flesh and the devil is trying to do. Falsify our navigational. We need to be true to the Word of God. We need to be true to the Christ-like character and follow Him because <coughs> very often destruction would result when they followed the wrong course. And that's what we have to be very careful of. And now let's look at patience at the top of page 2. Romans 15, 4 through 5 says, For, whoso for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Now the Word of God instructs us how to patiently endure. And it encourages us in the process. And it gives us hope, which is not I wish hope. It's the certainty. It's assurance that what we're following is true. We're not going off course. We're following God's course. And there's a couple of words here. The um, learning is our instruction. And through patience, that word is endurance. And we're going to look at it. It's, it's I put the word H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E. And I put the phonetic here, hoop om on a hoop om on a And it's a noun. It means an abiding under. So we have, in, we have endurance. Um, and we have the comfort or encouragement of the scriptures so that we can have hope or assurance. Now the God of patience, that's endurance. And consolation. That's, again, encouragement. Those two words, comfort and consolation, is parakalesis. That's not in your handout. We looked at that before when we were studying one of the one, of the one and others. And that word is encouragement. And remember, the Holy Spirit is called the great paraclete, the one that comes alongside and comforts us. Well, the scriptures also here are shown to be an encouragement and a comfort and a consolation. And God is the God of patience and encouragement, endurance. Now, so this comes from two different words. Uh, hupo, H-U-P-O, that means under, and memo, which means uh, abiding. So it means an abiding or living under. So the origin is uh, a description of a plant's ability to live under harsh and unfavorable conditions like suffering. And um, I have a quote here that I wanted to share with you. It talks a little bit more about that. And uh, this is a uh, anon anonymous quote in an article. And Romans 5, 3, and 4 says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience our proven character, and experience hope our assurance, certainty. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And in this article I wanted to share, patience is often associated with suffering. And it goes on to say, suffering or tribulation first produces patience or perseverance or endurance within us, Paul says. The Greek word translated patience or perseverance, that's hupomene, is a combination of a prefix meaning under or below and abode or living place. So thus the experience of suffering teaches us how to live 
under trying circumstances. As we develop such perseverance, endurance, or patience, we grow and experience our proven character. The Greek word here is closely related to one that means tested or approved because it was used in refining gold and silver where the dross is burned off and so it tested pure. Now let's look at the meanings here. Number one, uh, steadfastness. That means staying the course. Steady. Steadfastness. Constancy. Unchangeable. Always the same. Endurance. Long lasting. So not being moved from Christ likeness and a spirit filled walk despite sufferings and trials. Number two, cheerful or hopeful endurance based on assurance of God's care and provision. And number three, a steadfast waiting for God's provision or Christ's return. So you see those three different aspects. Now, the word here, patience is used in the New Testament as nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. So that's all of grammar. The two words used at nouns, and they mean abiding and long-suffering. Two words used as verbs, meaning long-suffering and long-tempered, and adjectives, descriptive words, gentle and forbear, and, number, and one word used as an adverb, which describes how we are to act long-suffering. So a definition that you would find in a dictionary, a secular, non-spiritual definition, would be the quality of enduring or bearing obstacles, misfortune or pain, without complaint. But here's a spiritual definition. There's a lot here, so listen carefully. And I hope you have your handout. This is toward the bottom of page two. Spiritual definition. Cheerfully abiding or dwelling in God's will steadfastly waiting on God's provision with hope and, and assurance, and consistently displaying and grow, growing in maturity, displaying maturity and growing in maturity in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in spite of, or even as a result of, obstacles, trials, and difficulties. Remember I put, I put as a result of, because often we are, the Lord uses those trials and obstacles to build patience. So cheerfully abiding in God's will, steadfastly waiting on God's provision with hope and assurance, and consistently displaying and growing in maturity in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, in spite of or as a result of all obstacles, trials, and difficulties. And I might add there, and people. Sometimes our difficulties are people. Okay, some examples. Now, I would love, we could spend the whole lesson just on Joseph, Job, or the Lord Jesus Christ. So I am going to move quickly through these uh, just so that we see the example. Now, Job 50, or rather Genesis 50, 15 through 21, I have 19 to start at 15. Joseph, if you remember, uh, this passage is about when Joseph at the, towards, well, right after his father died, his brothers came to him and said, listen, our father told us that after he died that I, we should come to you and uh, ask you, tell you that he said not to kill us for what we did to you. We recognize we were wrong and the evil which we did to you, we ask that you not do to us. And he said, listen, and then one of my favorite places in the Bible, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Verse, paraphrasing verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To see this, to bring this day to pass as it is this day to save many, much people alive. So thinking of, of what happened to Joseph, he was sold into slavery, misunderstood by his brothers. Uh, he was, uh, his brothers were envious and jealous, thought he was the favorite, so they were gonna kill him, but instead they threw, it, threw him in a hole and then sold him to slavery. So you can imagine what might have happened to him on the way to Egypt. He was 
falsely accused by Potiphar's wife after he worked himself into a, a job that was pretty decent. And she accused him of immoral behavior falsely. And so he went to prison. And then he worked in the prison and, and moved up to a good position. And he helped the baker, if you remember, and he helped the cupbearer. And the cupbearer says, I'll remember you when I get my job back, and, uh, as, as uh, Joseph predicted from his dream. And he forgot him. He was, so he was forgotten. And he spent more time in prison, unjustly. And he was forgotten by the cupbearer. And he endured patiently this time. But then the cupbearer remembered and came and got him to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And he faithfully, patiently served that nation. And then he was patient with his family when they came back. Uh, and instead of doing them harm, and even at the, after his father died, he patiently forgave them and endured um, their shenanigans, let's say. Not a biblical word, a southern word. And so Joseph was patient. Let's look at Job. Job is actually the poster saint uh, for, for patience. And in Job 1, 13 through 22, and 2, 9, and 10, discusses all the things that happened to Job. He lost, his, he lost all of his animals. He lost his servants. He lost his children. He lost his property. Uh, he lost his health. Uh, property, some of his property was destroyed by the storm. And not at all happened, right? Boom, boom, boom. It served one servant came, another servant came, another came. And what was his reaction? And he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, He shaved his head, he fell down on the ground and worshiped, verses 20 and 21. So patient endurance. He worshiped God. He acknowledged that God's grace was sufficient for him. And I want to read this uh, passage out of a sermon by C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, from January 1880. He says, Among men and women, the patience of Job is a great human and spiritual force. This morning, when I was meditating on it, that is, meditating on the patience of Job, I felt ashamed and humbled, as thousands have done before me. I asked myself, what do I know of patience when I compare myself with Job? Yet, as I thought of the patience of Job, it caused me to hope. If Job was patient under trial and suffering, why shouldn't I be patient too? He was only a man. What was produced in one man may be produced in another. He had God to help him, and so have I. He could fall back on the he could fall back on the living redeemer. So can I. And why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I attain patience as well as Job? It made me feel happy to believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I too could endure the will of God. Be like Job, beloved friend. Don't be struck down. What God has done for one, he could do for another. Since men and women in all generations are basically the same, since the great God is the same, and you can be sure he is, we too can have great patience in our limited circle. Our patience may be heard of among those who prize the fruits of the Spirit, and patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Once more, Job by his trials and the grace of God was lifted up into the highest position of usefulness. Job was useful before, useful before his trial as few men of wealth and influence have been. But now his life possesses an enduring fruitfulness which blesses multitudes every day. Even we who are here today have heard of the patience of Job. All the ages had this man for their teacher. Brothers and sisters, we do not know who will be blessed by our pains, our bereavements, by our crosses, if we have patience under them. This is especially so with God's ministries. If they are to be truly useful to God, then their path to usefulness is up the rocky side of the mountain. 
If we are to comfort God's afflicted people, we must first be afflicted ourselves. Tribulation will make our wheat fit to be bread for saints. Adversity is the choicest book in the, our library printed in black letters, but majestically illustrated. Job makes a glorious comforter and preacher of patience, but no one turns either to Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, who are the miserable comforters, because they had never been miserable. You, dear sisters, whom God will make daughters of comfort for your families, must pass through a scholarship of suffering too. A sword must pass through your own hearts if, you're, if you are to be highly favored and blessed among women. Yet let us all remember that affliction will not bless us if it is born impatiently. If we kick at the goad, it will hurt us and fail to act as a fitting stimulus. If we rebel against God's divine plan for our lives, we may turn his medicine into poisons and the dark cloud will produce a sparkling shower. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. We may turn his medicines into poisons and increase our own grief by refusing to endure them. Now, be patient, be patient, be patient, and the dark cloud will produce a sparkling shower. And finally, listen to this. You have heard of the patience of Job. Imitate it. You have seen what the Lord hath finally brought about. Rejoice in it. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Yield yourselves to him. And he, he, he ends with this prayer. Divine Spirit, plant in us the sweet gift of patience for our patient Savior's sake. Divine Spirit, plant in us the sweet gift of patience. Patience for our patient Savior's sake. Amen. Now the Lord Jesus is the final uh, illustration here. And the Lord Jesus, Luke 23, 33 through 40, uh, excuse me, 33 through 43, uh, describes Jesus with the thieves on the cross where everyone was reviling him, those that were crucifying, and the, the one that uh, the one was, uh, made fun of him and mocked him, and the other one said, uh, listen, this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to, to the Lord, remember me when thou come, comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The Lord Jesus Christ was the perfect illustration of patience. He was steadfast in God's will to go to the cross and suffer for our sins and endure that shame and suffering. Let this cup pass from me. It was the Lord's will, and he went and he did it. He, had, he, had the, he really meant all of those three aspects of the meanings of patience. He was steadfast in God's will. There was hopeful endurance and certainty of God's provision for him as he endured that suffering. And three, he waited on the Father's provision, resurrection over victory, death, and the sin, death, and the grave. And um, again, another quote much shorter from, from Spurgeon on 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. Um, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. And this is a, a sermon from Spurgeon on June 17, 1888, about the Lord Jesus Christ example. It's called The Love of God and the Patience of Christ. In the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, we see almighty patience. Legions of angels would have been glad to come to his rescue but he bowed alone in the garden and gave himself up to the betrayer without a word. And all the while, he was the most tender and graciously considered of everyone but himself. He goes on to say, Spurgeon goes on to say, On the Christ cross he cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, the wondrous patience of heaven's own Christ. Now let's look at this. 
look at the top of page three and the principles here. Number one, uh, patience is not passiveness. It's an active quality of our Christian character enabled by the Holy Spirit by which and through which we respond to unfavorable situations or unfavorable people for God's glory and our own growth. We are patient both in our trials and with each other. Remember I read Romans 5, 3 through 4, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations or pressure or tr trials and temptations and difficulties. Also knowing that those trials work patience, endurance, perseverance, and patience works experience or proven character and experience hope or assurance. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now, we look at, um, I shared part of this quote from Adrian Rogers, um, how God develops Christian character, and I'm going to read a different part of this, and this is on that same verse, and that we, he goes on to say that we need to be saved in order to develop Christian character, and one of the ways it uh, he says that that happens is through patience. He says, the Bible teaches that God wants to work a character quality in your heart known as patience. The word patient here is not a word of passiveness. It's not you just sit back and say, okay, fill me with patience. Actually, the word means endurance or constancy. We endure. What are some of the reactions when troubles come? Well, some men try to escape with a plane ticket, a ticket, a pill, a bottle, a needle, or even a gun. Others may even get cynical and shake their fist in the face of God. Some may recognize that God wants, us to, wants to teach us endurance, and it's his way of building Christian character. How do you respond? And he goes on to say, one of the greatest marks of your faith and your confidence in the Almighty God is your endurance, your perseverance, and your constancy or consistency when trouble comes. How do you measure up? Are you on course? Are you following the right course? Are you off course? Are you headed for destruction? Well, uh, the number two bullet, patience is reliance upon God under pressure focused on the calm assurance that God is in control of the outcome, even if we are not. Now, I have a lot of relatives in Tennessee. My dad had so many relatives, I could, it's the South. Everybody, he was related to everybody. So my cousin's son is an evangelist in uh, not a Baptist denomination, but he often has some pretty good things to say. And I found this on Facebook. His name is Ed Held. He said, the only man who has no problems is in the cemetery. You see, we all face problems, some big and others small, but nevertheless, they are there. Here's a little saying that has helped me while dealing with a problem or a trial. In the grist mill of life, problems can either wear you down or make you shine. So let them make you shine with God's help. In life, there are many things we have no choice over. There's one thing, however, God has given us a choice about. The choice is about how we respond to problems and trials. He says, I'm praying for you today, praying you don't get bitter, but you get better. Pastor Harder was fond of saying that. I love that phrase. Praying that the Holy Spirit would make you pliable and more like Jesus. In other words, developing Christ-like character. For example, patience. I'm praying that through it all, in the end, you're going to shine. And you remember that building character is, is actually uh, abiding under hardship and adversity. And we are to see the removal of, of the impurities from our lives so that we, like gold and silver, will shine 
the dross is removed and taken away. So, number three bullet, a, per, a patient person allows God to be God and does not give God deadlines and does not demand that God act according to his timetable. For example, Martha's impatience. Remember Martha, the Lord was over at uh, Mary and Martha's house and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha was encumbered with a lot of serving and she came and said, Lord, this is not fair. Tell, Martha, tell Mary to help me, Martha said that. And, and the Lord said, listen, she's chose one thing is needful and Mary had chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. In other words, Martha was worried about the wrong things. Sometimes we are too. And let's look at trials produce patience. This is bullet number four. Trials produce patience and patience produces growth. And uh, again, that passage, Romans 5, 3 through 4, and I have a quote I would like to share with you about that. And I'll get through my pages here. Um, Romans 5, 3 through 4. Uh, Harry Ironside, H.A. Ironside, in his Romans commentary says that Tribulation works patience if we accept it as from our loving Lord himself, knowing it is for our blessing. Many times we think it's for our curse. Out of patient endurance springs fragrant Christian experience as the soul learns how wonderfully Christ can sustain, aid, and help in every circumstance. And experience blossoms into hope, certainty, assurance, weaning the heart from the things of earth and occupying them with the heavenly setting and scene to which we are moving or hastening. Amen. Uh, bullet number five. Impatience leads, when we are impatient, that leads us to disobedience, which is sin. <clears throat> sin has consequences. And the example here is Saul in 1 Samuel 13, where he was told to go and destroy the Philippine, uh, Philistines, not Philippines, <clears throat> Philistines, and he, he failed to kill the king, and he did not kill all the animals and kept them for spoil. But when he was asked about it, he told Samuel, well, we wanted to make sure we sacrificed right away, so we saved some of these animals, and the people made me do it. And Samuel looked at him and said, God says to obey is better than sacrifice. He wants your obedience. That is your real sacrifice. And so impatience leads to disobedience. Number six, patience is a fruit of the Spirit produced in us as we walk in the Spirit. And reading briefly from Galatians, um, but the fruit of the Spirit, 522 through 25, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's patience. Now, a point I really want to make here, number seven bullet, to the extent that we believe or trust that God is faithful, our view of God, in other words, will determine if we're patient or not. Is God's grace sufficient? If we believe that, we'll be patient. If it's not, then we want to take things into our own hands. Patience is an evidence of our trust in God. When we are patient, we are trusting that God is our God and he will fulfill his promises. He will meet our needs, our real needs, not our wants, and will provide that which is best for his glory. Uh, remember the passage where Paul said, please remove this thorn in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And the Lord said unto him, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul said, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in, glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's grace is sufficient. God is God. We need to be patient with what, he, with what his provision is. We want to trust that God's grace is sufficient. Number eight bullet. God desires that we live patiently and wait on his provision. Lamentations 3, 22 through 26. 
It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And then moving to bullet eight, as our time has ended here, we should be waiting patiently for the Lord's return, not losing heart, but it actively enduring. James 5, uh, 7 through 11, he said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer, the husbandman, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren and prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy who endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He's full of pity. So patience in those four verses is mentioned five times, wait once, endure once, and several other uh, <coughs> references to patience, indirect references. We should live expectantly with patience, trusting in God's grace that it's sufficient for us. And quoting Spurgeon, my prayer for us is that, Lord, plant us in the sweet, plant in us the sweet gift of patience for our patience, Savior's sake. That's my prayer. Let's pray as we end. Father, I pray that you would teach us patience, that you would help us to trust and your provision, that we would be imitators of Christ's character in this area, that we would be imitators of Christ, that we would reflect to others the wonderful character of Christ, that people would see the Lord Jesus Christ in us, that we would be loving, patient, kind, gracious. I thank you for each one that is here. I pray your blessing upon them. All of us have <clears throat> trials and tribulations. The only ones that don't is, is our as is, is, is our Ed Hell said, or, or in the uh, cemetery. I pray, Father, that you would be with each one and during a trial, you would provide for them. I pray for those that are watching from home or elsewhere, that you would be with them. And I give us a good service to follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.